I proceed to empire, painted paddles there in our hands, pouring through this sacred land, water song, spirit, and rhythm of Peace. 
Bujo Bisandawiag, Bindigain, Shanskawin, Indigena Kaz, Megazi and Dordem, Wanaking and Debandakos, Kawabiganigo Kag and Donjiba, Minshot Makoche and Daina, Nanongom, Nimigwecha Wenda Mamaya and Sago. Hello, my relatives. Thank you so much for joining us. My name is Pearl. I'm originally from Standing Rock and I'm also from White Earth. And I'm a program manager at Native Governance Center. Native Governance Center is a nonprofit supporting indigenous change makers and native nations in strengthening tribal sovereignty. We are so excited for this conversation today around building an indigenized future through spirited leadership. And this is a personal interest of mine because I've been thinking about how do we decolonize our path lay, uh, of, ahead of us? And what are those steps we need to take in order to get there? And I am so honored to have both of these amazing women who are going to share about spirited leadership with us. I actually uh, swear by the soap from Hypajaja Pijuta um, from TPZ Wynn and her family. We use it daily in our home and it's really a great way that they've um, shared that good medicine. And I know Grace as well. And just, they're both wonderful humans, and we are so excited to have this conversation today. If you'd like to know more about the work we do at Native Gov, you can visit our website. It's us on social media, uh, also at Native Gov. And now I'd like to turn it over to TPC Wynn. Um, honored to be here and asked to open with a prayer. And I ask uh, for all relatives who are participating to have compassion on me because I'm still learning um, and there's lots I don't know. But, um, uh, Tungashlava <laughs> Oshi we chakilae to gush level kantaka na o we chakiae. Midakiase. I just ask that um Tungashila creator shows compassion and pity on those of our people who are in hospitals right now and those of us uh who have relatives in the prisons and behind the um, jails and also for those who are um, grieving and hurting right now in this time. Um, I ask that um, Creator has pity on all of us and helps us see through these these hard times. But I also uh, gave thanks for our for our day because uh, we still have gratitude despite our challenges. And that's um, that was what my prayer was for um, opening this meeting and I'm just honored to be here and um, I, I'll open with the, the first question. And we're going to be talking about building an indigenized future. And so my question to Grace is, um, I guess right away asking, what does an indigenized future mean to you, Grace? Well, first off, good afternoon, TP. It's good to see you. Um, and to all the viewers that are online today, I hope this video finds you all in good health and good spirits. 
And, you know, in our community here of Chashayapi, we're located in Southwest Minnesota. We're a very small Dakota community, part of the Ocheti Shakoi. We are the Badewa Kantua Band of Dakota here. And um, our land base is really small, yet we, we hold a, a heavy voice on what we do here as far as looking at how we look at our indigenized future and we continue to grow and expand and move forward. And one of the things then concepts and values that I see within Chashayapi is Kichiapi, is helping one another and being a good relations to one another. We do this through a model of indigenous in ingenuity. We put the community first. And that's one of the priorities here that I see with leadership, um, even before the pandemic. And I, my term here within tribal council is I've seen that we've always put the community voice first. We are stronger together and we see that when we do work together. We also face systemic in inequalities and that's something that a lot of our indigenous sovereign nations do across all of Indian country. Yet we see that we're more stronger and better equipped to face it when there are greater dedication with each other and we're relying on one another. And that's why we always look at that value of Onkichiapi is helping each other so that we can all work together. Beautiful. That's that's beautiful. Um, I was speaking with my daughter and about this question, and um, she mentioned, you know, are you, what is your audience? Because an indigenized future looks really different to indigenous people versus non-indigenous people, and so um, I thought that was a really good input from my um, my oldest daughter, who is going to be sixteen. And, um, you know, looking through her lens and what she was thinking, because we currently live outside our tribal community, but we are invested community members and we never uh, feel like we're outsiders or anything because we're so connected to our homelands and we still carry our, our home and our hearts and everything that we do. And so we were talking about what an indigenized future looks for tribal members that aren't uh, currently living on their homelands and it was just a, it was beautiful input from her because I hadn't thought about it in that in that lens and so um, I guess is there any input that you have for those tribal members from your community and other community members from other parts of Ocheti Shakoi that um, that you could speak to that and how you know they can embrace an indigenized future regardless of where their current, um, you know, physical address is. That's a really good point and kudos to your daughter for thinking that way. And that's exactly what it is, is it's thought, you know, and we instill those values and teachings in our little ones, no matter where we are. And I think that it's important that we continue to just teach them, keep, teach our little ones, nurture them, teach them about who they are, where their ancestors, who their ancestors were, Teach, teach them about their clans, their societies, all those things. I think it's really important, even though we may not always live out where all our relatives are and we may live somewhere else, it's always good to reconnect through stories through family history and our, and also ancestry and just looking back at who your bloodline is, you know, and, and who are the chiefs of your tribe and how the structures of your tribe were. And also the biggest thing for me has always been the language. Language has always been the foundation, you know, and making sure, and I know a lot of tribes now have a lot of language resources online, um, things that help you stay connected, even though you're not back in on the reservation or within your community. So I just want to just say, just try to connect through those ways too. That would be helpful. Yes, that's beautiful. Thank you. And so another question um, was, how are you personally incorporating spirited leadership into your community engagement work and as well as your role um, in your nation's tribal council? Well, I am serving my first term on tribal council here for Lower Sioux Indian community. It is a four year term, staggered terms. We have five elected officials that sit on our body of tribal government here in Lower Sioux. 
And, you know, I really wanted to use this opportunity to help bring awareness to different topics and issues that I've seen that were going on at the time that I took office. But during this time, it has it has tr shifted a tremendously to focus more on our cultural teachings and our life ways and our pathways, because we're looking at how unstable the system has been since that we've been governing under and also the way that we've been structured. And so I've been taking this opportunity to really just be more involved in the community, helping provide services, do what I need to do. And not only myself, but I see my colleagues doing the same, doing things that are definitely not usually the norm for a tribal leadership or, or even elected official at that. I mean, we, we helped with mad food, uh, mass food distributions. We've also helped with distributing other supplies to families in need and also doing a lot of videos and, and trying to communicate and stay. Communication was key with how we engage with our community during this time and always posting videos. So for me, always making sure that I'm staying uh, close to the community, knowing what the needs are, what is going on within the community. And one of the biggest things for me is always coming from the um, spiritual background and that kind of making sure that I'm continuing to take care of myself so I can take care of others, smudging and doing those things that are necessary. And I wanna say that to any leaders in a leadership position is make sure that you take that time for yourself and so that you can be strong for your people and your nation. And so just making sure that I'm, I'm being aware of that and um, how I approach things in the community in that way. That's beautiful. I, I, I believe that um, all of our tribal councils, elected leadership within our Ocheti Shakoe territory and other tribal nations can probably really look to the amount of community engagement that you're involved in because that to me just um, sounds so beautiful and it's what our communities need. I, um, I know a little bit about what our tribal council goes through and, um, and how personal the work is and how hard uh, the work is for families and for the individuals who are elected leaderships because it is a system that was imposed on us and we're doing the, you're, we're doing the best uh, with what we have. And um, sometimes that doesn't, that doesn't always fulfill the, the needs of our people, but at the same time, um, it's beautiful to be able to be working on the ground with your community in the community because sometimes mm -hmm. I, I believe that um, our people, our elected leaderships tend to forget and they get overwhelmed. And so it's, it's really beautiful what you shared about um, your foundation being our, our ways of belief and our spirituality. That's the foundation that really can serve our people. And that's just beautiful. Um, I wanted to ask if any in the audience who are watching, if they had any questions for, for Grace or for myself. Um, but again, I just wanted to share that that's just a beautiful way for any leadership. If I um, heard or had feedback from any leader that their foundation was on Kichiapi, that that is a leadership that I would want to follow. And I would want my children and family to stand behind and with that kind of leadership in our communities. And so that's just beautiful. And I, I think um, we can all look to your community and your work as um, exemplary for our people. And that's, again, that's just beautiful. And so the well, next question you. is, oh, sorry. I did wanna to add to that. Um, another thing that I've seen with, um, I guess for me is, I always think I, that for sure that we lead by example. And one of the things that I, I make sure that in my values and teachings is that I, I don't always necessarily just look at programs or de departments that should be doing things 
usually what we do is we'll step up and we'll just make it happen. I'll give you a perfect example. You know, we hear of all these statistics right now of what are what our people are going through, mental health issues, and as well as domestic violence and other uh, abuse that's going on within our community. And I do help a lot of different women and children during this time. And I don't bring it to our justice system all the time. We, we handle things on our own in a, in a more of a cultural healing way of an approach to it. And being able to help and provide services to individuals that need it rather than saying, well, you should be contacting our family services department or you should be contacting our law enforcement, our victim services. Instead of always pushing people away, I use it as an opportunity to say, what do you need? What do you need to be safe right now? What do you need from me right now? And that's one of the ways that I've learned how to um, to engage with the community and also in my leadership capacity and role. And um, it's a lot different, like I say, than a lot of other um, government officials in a capacity and role like our, as tribal leaders, you know, we do those types of things. And I, I, and like you said, we lead with the heart and just having that compassion for our people too. That's beautiful. Um, again, I just, I think, I believe that a lot of our tribal councils and our elected leadership um, are moving towards this, this, this standard of our using our values as a foundation. And that's really beautiful when you ask, you know, your own community members, what do you need? Because, and then, and then following through with action after that, that is, you know, immediately helpful. And Again, um, I just commend you on that level of leadership because that is leading with your heart and that's, um, that's beautiful. And I really believe that more of our, of our elected leadership um, can learn to lead with our hearts. And I'm not in any way, shape or form um, uh, negating the contributions of our male relatives, but I do see that uh, it's a lot of our women that can lead with our hearts for whatever different, you know, reasons, but that that's what I see and I believe and um, on Standing Rock, we have a number of women on tribal council and those are the women that I, I see as really leading our people with our hearts. And sometimes they go up against um, different ideas and different structures that I think we're experiencing a little technical difficulty. So we'll just um, sort of recap what TP was, was mentioning is how leading with our heart is a way to bring um, prosperity and bring that engagement with the community. Because as a leader, you're also with the community and um, that's sometimes uh, not an approach that's commonly used. So. Um, I, th I see some questions coming in, um, but is there anything else you wanted to add on, on, on to that before we go on to the next question? No, no, not at this time, Pearl. Thank you. And what, uh, what other sources of inspiration uh, and strength are you using to build an indigenized future. You mentioned a few things. Um, is there anything else that um, inspires you to um, 
work on the things that you do? Yes, there's quite a few things. And one of them um, that I always think about is, of course, learning from our ancestors and thinking back at the, the, the pathway that they had to pave and how courageous and a lot of dedication and just being steadfast. And I know that right here in Minnesota Makoche, we had the um, survival of 1862 and it happened right here in Chashayapi in Lower Sioux is where that, that war began. And so growing up in a place where uh, not only a major point of history for my own people, but for the state and the residents of the state today and for the country too. But knowing that that, that same um, strength and, and determination that my ancestors had continues to run through me and it, and, and it moves me in a way and so I really pay attention to the land. I pay attention to what is around me. And that helps guide me in what I need to do and how I need to respond. A good story about that would be Bede Makaska, you know, and that story is very powerful. And those missionaries that visited that journaled how the Dakota were gardening more than what they needed for their own people and within their Teoshbaye, within their camp. And to them, they thought they were crazy. They thought something was wrong with them. Like, why are they, why are they planting and, and, and gardening way more than what they needed for their own camp? Little did they know that they knew that that was fertile ground. They knew that that was good grounds to and land that was very nourished with a lot of good soil so that they could plant extra to help the other relatives that they don't have that good of fertile land and they shared their resources outside of their own camp. And to me, I think about that story and how we continue to do those things today and, and do, like I talked about the value of of just being there and being helpful and helping each other. And that's exactly what we're doing today. Even with these webinar, webinars that NGC is putting on, these are resources and ideas that you are gathering from different tribal indigenous leaders that are thinking about, like I said, that ingenuity of just indigenous ingenuity. And we're looking at the approach in a different matter. And I think, and I give kudos to NGC for taking that lead and initiative to gathering these resources for a lot of different tribal nations so that we can learn from each other and could support one another. And I just appreciate the opportunity. Thank you so much for that, Grace. I really um, love how uh, your the strength of your ancestors is what helps you and grounds you in your leadership. And that's something that I think goes back to our original instructions when we think about how we are supposed to be as Indigenous people, as Lakota, Dakota, Ojibwe people, um, and how we relate to one another. That's so beautiful that that story you shared about Bade Makaska, how, how they planted more than they needed so that they could share with others that didn't have that resource. And that's very much how we take care of each other. And th that was a beautiful way to um, to share that um, building indigenized future of going into um, our ancestry. Mm -hmm. And I know Pearl to add to that is for me it was learning the language is learning my own language helped me so much to reconnect with not only my ancestors but I said to the land too because our land tells a story and there's a relationship to it. And we're very fortunate in Minnesota Makoche here on our land is there's a lot of place names that are in Dakota that demonstrate how powerful it is with our language and our, our connection to our land and place names. And so growing up, I always wanted to learn the language. And so when I was in high school, I had the opportunity to learn from a fluent first language speaker and really took me under the wing. And one of the things that I started off with is I presented him with some 
Chandi and I asked him if he could translate for me the Dakota story about um, De Sawi, about white buffalo calf pipe woman, all in the language, no English. And I replayed it over and over again. And I had him record it on one of those little old school tape recorders. And I, I would constantly play that story over and over again, because there's something really special when you hear a first language speaker just speak fluently and tell stories. And, and it's different than um, learning language from the textbooks, you know, and it's totally different the way that they speak. And I really appreciated that when I was growing up and hearing language. And that really grounded me and connected me to the land and to the ancestors. And I knew how important it was to, to, to make sure I stayed close to the language. That's so beautiful, Grace. Everything you're saying is so beautiful and just good, good words and good medicine. And I understand too how uh, language is so important for how we, how we are as um, we carry out our lives daily and relations and um, honoring the people that came before us and just how we walk this earth. Um, I've been fortunate also to hear first language speakers and know how um, beautiful and lovely that is. So um, thank you so much for sharing that. And now we have TP back and I'll turn it back over to her. Thank you, sorry about that. Um, the next question is for you, Grace. What advice do you have for leaders working to strengthen their communities during COVID? Thanks, TP. This is a really good question. <clears throat> well, here in Chashayapi, you know, when the pandemic first hit, immediately we responded. Immediately we established our emergency operations center. We went live on March 18th of 2020. And, it, and from there, we've been 24 hours all the time around the clock trying to provide services. And a lot of it was policy, of course, and I know a lot of other tribal nations did this. And this was really to exercise in our sovereignty. As tribal nations, we have that sovereign right to enact our own policies during this time. And on March 18th, we also did a declaration of state of emergency. And we also did, we also closed our casino that same day. And so that day was very, um, I always, I will never forget March 18th, you know, and it really changed tremendously. And one of the other things that happened in March is we did also our shelter in place order and closure of our reservation boundaries. And that was something that a lot of, I know our other relatives weren't able to do. And um, given their land base, um, working within their state agencies and capacity and their roles and relationships with that, but here we were able to do a lot of those things. And the other big important thing that we did immediately is communication. We knew communication was key. We knew that we needed to engage with the community and reassure them that we are in this all together, that we love each other, that we care for each other and that we'll be there for each other. And one of the things is we needed to, we recognized that we needed to remove the stigma that was attached to COVID as far as if you did receive, if you are COVID positive, how people will treat you or talk about you, things like that. We wanted to make sure that we, we encouraged and uplifted each other because we knew mental health played a huge, tremendous role for individuals that have been affected with COVID. And so we wanted to make sure that we sent that message out. And sure enough, um, when we started seeing uh, increase in COVID positive cases here in Chashayapi, we immediately seen the community respond naturally by helping one another, um, getting supplies, making masks for each other, um, making elderberry syrup for each other. I mean, we, we seen people bring vitamins and nutrients and medicines to doorsteps. And those were the things that we seen from the community grassroots and that I feel like really happened 
through a lot of our communications and making sure that leadership was encouraging folks to be there and watch out for each other because we're here to watch out for you too. The other thing was partnerships. And it's really unique in the state of Minnesota. We have 11 um, tribally recognized or um, federally recognized tribal nations here. And our working relationship with the state um, happened before Governor Walls. It happened with Governor Dayton. And there was a strong uh, relationship and it started with the tribal state relations training. And through that, we've seen a really great um, engagement happening with the state when, when the pandemic happened. We have conference calls daily with our 11 tribal nation leaders. We have those calls. We've been doing that since April. We've been having those calls. And on those calls, we really try to support one another. If there's an idea that we are doing or if someone else is doing, we share those ideas with each, other, with, each, with each other. There's a lot of transparency with each other. Also the governor and Lieutenant governor's office have been very helpful in providing, very, um, they've been very upfront and transparent with the tribal nations. If the governor is going to do a new executive order, he does reach out personally to the tribal leaders to let them know what he's going to be announcing and when he's going to be making that announcement. And also we've been collaborating with a lot of the federal, state and local emergency operations um, for here in the state like MDH, um, um, the Mayo Clinic, they have been very helpful with coordinating with us with our testing and things like that. So, and another one, like I said, was our emergency operations, our um, emergency health operations. So um, we hold daily briefings our, um, with our emergency operations and essential department staff. And that has been very helpful. So we all are all on the same page on what we need to do to respond where we're at with things. And then we also implemented um, a lot of safety measures for our community and making sure that we had um, resources for community and the health um, as far as telemedicine was a big one that we did right away. And then we also did curbside um, medication pickup immediately. So we knew that we needed to provide that right away for our community. And um, like I said, again, communications. We did uh, daily videos. We transitioned from quarterly uh, community meetings to monthly community meetings so that we constantly were updating community with anything new that was going on, especially right now with vaccines is making sure that um, community knows our response with that, what, is, what, what we're going to be doing, what's our plans. And so I know that that's been helping a lot of the, the community members to be a little bit more at ease during this time, as far as them knowing what the tribal government is doing in the best interest of them. And so for us, a lot of those things um, have just been what I've seen that we've done here in, in Chashayapi that might help other tribal nations. I know a lot of other tribal nations are doing a lot of amazing things out there. And not only tribal nations, but nonprofit organizations, grassroots organizations. I do wanna give a shout out to Dakota Wichoha. They're a nonprofit organization based out of Morton, Minnesota. They have been responding. I know their, their main focus is around uh, Dakota language and life ways and teachings. But I know that they have been working and coordinating with the sous chef on getting meals out here into our rural communities out here to families and individuals um, with frozen meals too as well. And as well as providing um, service or um, programs for Dakota language and youth. And I know I just, I, I see a lot of work that other individuals are doing and I appreciate it because I see everybody just collaborating and trying to help one another with what we're dealing with. Beautiful, wonderful. I, um, this next question is gonna sound odd after all of the, <laughs> all of the things that you just shared because it's, um, it's definitely intertwined and I think you did answer it. Um, you know, the next question was going to be, 
what brings you hope. But for me, when listening to all of your, your sharing of the response that your tribe has done for community, I mean, that gives me hope. And that's just beautiful work and um, definitely inspiring. So I believe that you did answer that question. Um, if there's anything else you want to add, though, um, you're welcome to do that. But, you know, I just want to share that you everything you shared was definitely inspiring and inspiring hope and and that's beautiful well i do want to add tb that you know during this time it's really hard because we can't see relatives you know we can't we can't um see each other for face to face you know given a different time when we're having the same kind of discussion if we were in a different time we'd be having this face to face live you know people could see us engaging with one another in person but you know that that part has been very challenging for me and my family you know i just want to um touch on something that's a little bit personal but i want individuals to use this as hope and inspiration is, you know, we had a loss in our family. I lost my dad, Galen Drapo, in October. And it was really hard to go through something like that and try to be socially distant and things like that. And it was really challenging for relatives when in our teachings, when we talk about how we nurture our mourners and those that had a loss, it's really challenging to be able to do that you know, and to be there for somebody that is going through something like that. And then I know that there's relatives that are going through that when it's COVID related and a loss in their family. And so what, what really has helped me is the, the, the community within that I live in that I call home here of Chashayapi is people brought things and dropped it off or they shipped things in the mail or they sent a message of encouragement what I see that we do a lot with social media is we'll comment on somebody's comment, we'll send prayers. But I really wanna encourage you relatives to do a little bit more than just send a comment, pick up the phone and call, send a package in the mail, you know, really show that you care for one another a little bit more than just commenting and saying, I'll send prayers. I think that we tend to do that a little bit too much during this time because I know it's really hard because everybody's posting all their things on social media and they really want to let all the relatives know what's going on and update them. But really, I encourage you to take a little bit further and if you really care for somebody, show them a, a little bit more by sending them something or doing something like that. And medicine goes a long way too. And sending medicine always is helpful too for people that are going through something really hard within their families. Thank you. That's that's very true. We we get into that where you know social media is more. It's this simple way, and it's it's thoughtful and it's nice to leave a comment. But I definitely do believe. Um, in what you shared about taking it a step further. And that's part of the work that my family has been doing in sending out um, COVID medicines that, you know, that will support, you know, healing and nourishment for our people. And instead of, um, and I'm not saying that because there are people who, who really do stand by their, their prayers and they, they are going to pray and that's beautiful, but um, in addition to that, and not to negate that, that, um, you know, that paired with action, you know, prayer paired with action is always um, much more powerful. And so I wanted to move to the first uh, question that was sent. And um, it's actually a question for me. <laughs> it's, uh, can you tell us a bit about your small business and how supporting Indigenous community, how you're supporting indigenous communities during COVID and how does spirited leadership show up in our operations? And so for those of you who are watching, we, um, we have a small family business and it's Ha'ipa Jaja Prejuta, which is medicine soaps in our Lakota and Dakota language. And we make, um, well, we make soaps and we infuse them with our traditional uh, medicine plants. And 
we began doing that because our youngest child um, suffered from a lot of skin allergies and skin sensitivities, and we couldn't figure it out. And in the spirit of the way that our people prepare food, we are always mindful of our energy and we're, we have protocols about women on their moon time, not preparing food for ceremony and things like that. And really kind of embracing that and putting that towards um, creating soaps for our children that would help them heal. And so we then just began in our home uh, when we were still living on Standing Rock. We currently live in Washington state, but um, it's something that we want it to take a, um, it's something we want it to do for our family. And we began sharing um, at giveaways and things, and then it just grew. But really what I guess the important part is, is everyone can take uh, these baby steps that are much healthier for the world that we live in and healthier for our families. And um, sometimes when I'm like taking a shower and I wash my hair with um, like our sage soaps and I know that it's sage is in it that me and my family harvest it from where we're from. My home is in Porcupine Creek, north of Fort Yates on Standing Rock. And to me, it's the most beautiful place in the world. It's, it, um, it's adjacent to, uh, it flows into the Missouri and that's right along where my, you know, where I was raised and that's where we get our sage. And uh, for me, when I'm washing my hair with it, I know that that sage is in there and we harvest it and it just, that's beautiful. And so um, knowing that we, we have an opportunity to share that with a wider audience and people can also um, share. And so that's just something that we're happy to do and we, we love it. It, it sounds um, kind of, it's been a journey to go from Lakota language immersion teachers to um, small business owners and making soap, but it's, it's all intertwined and interwoven. And we definitely um, showcase that, I guess showcase is not a good word, but one, one thing we do is we have a foundation of generosity. And so anytime anyone gets anything from us on our website, we share what we call a giveaway soap. And we want, we, we do that because it's important for us to exemplify generosity. And because we are using our traditional medicine plants that we do give back and we do provide that, that wopila, that wopila, that, that generosity value that is an integral part of everything that we do as Ocheti Shakoi people. Um, the next question would be for you and it's how do you balance meeting community requests with what is priority without making other things seem unimportant? It's a very good question, especially during this time when we have to do policy, we still need to abide by, you know, our own bylaws within our tribal nation. <clears throat> and I know that for us, we do have an amazing executive secretary. I want to give a shout out to Miranda Sam. She keeps us on task. Um, she has been very good at scheduling out our calendars, making sure that we, we are being mindful and cognizant of the things that need to be, to, to be dealt with. And so putting together those agendas for us and keeping us on task. And she knows that we're out in the community. I'll give you an example as we have one of our tribal elected officials out there right now. Um, we have a new hospital that's being built on the border town here and they asked for the tribe to, we've been um, doing these dugout canoes because those were one of our traditional, like the uh, dugout canoe was part of our, 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 our means of transportation, you know, for our ancestors. And so we started learning how to do it and the hospital commissioned the tribe and um, to make a dugout canoe for the new hospital. And so they're delivering it right now. And that's one of the elected officials. And so we really try to balance it out and know that we need to do things that aren't traditional in a, a sense that others would probably be a little upset. Like, why are they out delivering a dugout canoe 
when we need things done on the on the tribal government side. And like I said, our secretary, she really keeps us on task and makes sure that we know what's going on on that end. So we're not always overlooking things that need to be done and prioritized. That's beautiful. I think everyone needs a good secretary. <laughs> I know I wish I had one. <laughs> um, okay, so the next question for you is, how would you recommend a tribal community resolve the mentality of off-res membership versus on-res membership? That is a very good question. I remember when I was younger, um, I had a lot of relatives that lived in St. Paul. A lot of my family grew up in St. Paul. That's where they were, they lived. And they chose to move to St. Paul to, to get better jobs, to provide for their families. But I remember at a young age when they would come home to visit there, um, I remember hearing a conversation about them not always feeling so welcomed. And it really hurt me to hear that because I didn't understand that. To me, we, we get tied up on these boundaries of reservation lines. And, we, and I don't look at those things. I look at it as we're related. Their, their ancestors are the same ancestors of mine and they're from here. And in, in whether you're off reservation, on reservation, you still have that ancestral bloodline that flows through you, that keeps you connected. You can be on the other side of the world, but yet that's still in you and that spirit walks with you from our ancestors. And so that's why, again, like in the beginning, um, it's reconnecting with where you're from, who's your family, you know, who's your, the societies, clans, um, all those types of things, songs, language, those things are very important to stay connected. And, you know, and it's hard politically sometimes because within our tribal nations, we have a system that's set up and those systems were forced upon us by the United States government. And for me, speaking personally for, for our tribe is we are an IRA tribe. You know, we have, we're part of that constitution under 1934 um, Indian Reorganization Act, you know, and so we still have this old dated constitution here that we, we have to govern under. And it is conflicting. It's conflicting with our traditional, um, like our sovereign ways, you know, and our sovereign way of governing ourselves. And it, it does get challenging at times when we get to those conversations about citizenship and, and those types of things. But what I always say to any relative is just, you know, you are just as much a part of this as anybody else because your ancestors are from there. And it's, sometimes it's hard when you just look at enrollment. But if we put down those walls and really look at it as you are um, part of a sovereign nation in a sense that you know where you're from and who your people are, and you don't need to look at it as I'm living off or on reservation. Yes, beautiful. I, I hadn't realized because I lived for the most part my life within my tribal community. And now I live as a guest among the Nimipu people's homelands. And there's definitely a different, um, a different role you play as a guest on somebody else's homelands. I, I hadn't um, had to learn that role, but I am I'm grateful to be a guest here in their homelands and just truly honored because I've been embraced by many Nimipu relatives in a, in a really beautiful way. And so that's really important for, for um, uh, embracing and feeling like I'm a part of a community, even though when I first moved here, I really, I had, I had a hard time and I thought, like I, I pray in Lakota and do I um, like do these spirits of this land hear my prayers? Like I had all these, all these like different things I was thinking and worried about. And eventually I just found peace knowing that um, I carry my people, my ways, I carry who I am in my heart everywhere I go. And I can be 
uh, on the other side of the world, but I'm still Lakota, I'm still Dakota, and my ancestors are always with me. And that's something that I've um, found peace with. But at the same time too, I, I believe there has to be a learning and a relearning for our people to really understand those imposed boundaries because they're not, they've, they're imposed boundaries that we didn't create. Mm -hmm. And just because a boundary exists in a Western world doesn't mean our uh, connection to those lands stop after you pass that reservation boundary. Mm -hmm. And so just encouraging, always encouraging for a relearning and a, and a learning for our people to understand that those ideas have been imposed on us for a, a number of years and to try our best to shed those and embrace um, where our homelands truly are is where our, you know, where we have a word in our language for a place. That means that our people made our homes there. Mm -hmm. And so anywhere, like we have a, a name for the Rocky Mountains and we have a name for the Bighorn Mountains and we have a name for um, clear up into Saskatoon, you know, and so though that is Ocheti Shakoi Tamakoche. And and so yeah, our people, we just need to all uh, embrace the relearning process. And so it's just it's beautiful when you really get into um, how we're able to really reclaim and relearn in this time. And um, I don't think I would have done those things if I didn't leave my tribal community and really forced out of a comfort zone to really think in a different way. Um, so the next question is, can you talk more about how language plays in facilitating healing for yourself and for your community in this challenging time? Mm -hmm. Well, I know by learning from first language speakers, I did have the opportunity to hear some of their stories about boarding school era and what they had gone through. And it really helped me to know how easier I have of a pathway than, our, than a lot of our elders within our native communities had to continue to learn language and it's in a nurturing manner. And I think for me, that was really important that I heard from an elder is make sure that when you're teaching, learning, that you need that nurturing environment because the way that the language was taken is we really need to make sure that we lay that that kind of nurturing foundation for one another and it really helped me and guided me to 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 want to learn more and to do my part as far as revitalizing and sustaining our language and our teachings and life ways and by no means will I ever say I'm fluent but I continue to, to try to pass those teachings on to not only my children, but I have nieces and nephews, you know, even elders that have asked me to do language classes. I've done language classes for some of our elders here in our community, even that weren't and didn't have that opportunity that share that story about their parents that went to boarding school and didn't want them to learn the language, you know, and so for me, that's always been very important is making sure that we're aware that we did have that with all our tribal nations, as far as the boarding schools go, and that we now we have this uh, obligation to not only our ancestors and our elders that had gone through that, but to each other in our future to, to, to pass these on. The language is very important. Yes, and I would I would agree with everything you're saying, and and know that uh, language, it's really, it's our superpower, and it belongs to each and every one of us. And and there's times when I um, make mistakes or I mispronounce or I said something out of line or anything, and I always uh, reflect and know that every word of our language is a victory for our people and for our ancestors and our relatives who went through those, those true human tragedies and that true human suffering as children to be assaulted by figures of power and to be um, traumatized for their, their whole lives by um, the way that they were treated for speaking the only language they knew. And, 
And so I know that every single word is a victory for our people. And every, and even here in Nimipu territory, um, when I'm teaching little guys, I will, and they're all non-tribal um, students, I'll say Tatsmewi, which means good morning in um, Nimiputim, which is the Nez Perce language. And I will say, doesn't that feel good? Because we have strengthened the Nimipu language. We have helped, we have supported and given nourishment and life to the Nimipu language. And I, I believe that about our languages, that every single word spoken is a victory and strengthens us and strengthens our, our ancestors and our people and it strengthens our future. And, and I do believe that language is our superpower. So everything you're saying is just, I can um, get behind and with and that's beautiful. Um, we, I believe, are running out of time. Um, I think Pearl is going to um, step in soon, but it's, it's been a beautiful conversation, and um, I'm just honored to meet you. I've never uh, had the pleasure in person. I hope that changes, and um, I just am inspired by your work. My great-grandmother was from Chanshayapi, um, and, and so uh, they relocated to Spirit Lake, and then my grandfather married my grandmother from uh, Standing Rock and made his home at Standing Rock. But we do have ties to uh, Minnesota, the Dakota homelands. And um, my grandmother would always say, never forget that you're Dakota. Never forget that those are your homelands. And she told me her grandpa was born in a community um, near the border of Wisconsin in Minnesota. And so um, every time I go home, uh, to the homelands, to the Dakota homelands and the woodlands, she would always say, um, remember that you're home and um, and you're welcome there and that you don't, no one can ever make you leave and that, and you can go home in peace because they didn't, they didn't get to live in peace there. And so I just, I've always uh, embraced that part and just is really beautiful. And so um, this has been an amazing, uh, beautiful conversation that I'm, I'm really grateful to have learned and to been involved and hear from your hear from you and your work and your dedication and love for your community it's something that i believe all of our people can embrace and get behind and and your people are blessed to have you in your leadership capacity so kidamaya kid kidamaya to both of you for sharing such a wonderful, beautiful conversation. Um, I really enjoyed that last part about the language and how each word we speak is a victory for our people, our ancestors and strengthening that spirit of the language and how healing that can be and um, perhaps why it's emotional when, when we speak that language and when we're learning it. Um, and it just goes to show how, how much nurturing we, we have naturally and innately as, as Indigenous people, as Dakota, Lakota, Anishinaabe people um, of this land. And I really appreciate all of the ways that you've shared how, how we can think about indigenizing our future and the stories you've shared um, with us today. And for those of you that joined us today, if you feel inspired by uh, what's been shared, you can feel free to go to our website and, um, you know, uplift and continue supporting conversations like this by donating. Um, that makes our work sustainable in order to do these things and um, share this important work that our communities in um, our region are doing. And for those that are on Zoom, we have a, a survey we'll send out to you um, so take a look at your emails and we'll send a link there. And we really appreciate you all being here and wish you good health and wellness in this time. And that, um, you are as grateful as us for this conversation today. Toksha, gigawabamen. We are strong together, we can, we will.
Together.